so what the talk is about is, is what we are doing in terms of environmental computing, as we call it, on our big uh, HPC machine, which is called SuperMOOC NG. The NG stands for Next Generation. So it's already the third machine in a series of machines. And the ideas or the background uh, of this environmental computing effort that we are doing is this partnership between computer and domain sciences. So I could choose other focus areas, more or less, uh, and I could still explain what I believe is, is, is the right way to work between the computer science part on the one side and the domain sciences on the other side. So if you want to take a look, this is our uh, Leibniz Supercomputing Center, what you see here in the front. So you walk in on the right hand side and you have the uh, lecture room building, you have two institute buildings, you have in the second row a small cube, that's the visualization center. And then on the left side with the one and the zero, you see the twin cube, which has 72 meters in length and 36 and 36 uh, in, in width and height. Uh, so that's where we have all the equipment. That's where the machines are stored. You see on the rooftop a couple of things like the 80 antennas for lightning, but you also see these white boxes. And the white boxes are an indication of uh, how much we're doing at the moment. Each of these white boxes is cooling 2.2 megawatts. So in total, we can go up to 10 megawatts. We're using about uh, seven at this point in time. And that comes up to, in, 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 in the local currency, in about 1,000 to 1,200 euros for electricity only in one hour. So I'm always saying in three days we are spending just on electricity the equivalent of an annual budget for a PhD student or in one year we are spending 120 PhD student salaries just on electricity. So the things that we are doing need to be useful. It, it, it's quite some amount uh, that's in there and it's actually a particular task that we are doing. As you see, we are providing IT services for science which means the twin cube here contains all the computers, all the stuff that we need to provide IT services for the sciences that we are responsible for. So it's really this particular task, which also means that we are not doing anything with controlling financial administration. So no SAP, no, I would always say other stuff. We are only doing the fun stuff more or less. Now, the twin cube consists of five floors. Uh, and if we stop, start from the top floor, on the top floor you have the big HPC machine, which is a uh, super MOOC NG. I'll come to that in a second. And we have one floor, which is all the servers and the networking. And then uh, half a floor, which is all the um, uh, storage and, and archiving capacity. So in total, the building has about uh, 10,000 square meters or 150,000 square feet. And we are only using one third of that for the, for the computers. So because we need an extra floor for the cooling, we need an extra floor for all the electronics and the conversioning. We have our own water production uh, center and all these things. So that's all included there. And it's actually composed as a dark center so there is nobody working in there. There's only this bridge, as you see, between the building, which is the only entrance, and that's the, for security also, that's where we have all the guards and these things. Now let's go back to the top floor, and that should be coming up, here it is. This is our big machine, this is SuperMOOC Next Generation. So it's 80 cabinets, 84 cabinets to be concrete. It's 311,000 cores, uh, pure Xeon system. So there's no GPU in there. I'll also be coming back to that in a second. We have been providing systems like that for decades. So actually the center was founded in 1962. And as uh, David already said, it belongs to the Bavarian Academy of Sciences and Humanities. And some people wonder why it does not belong to one of the, the, the Munich universities. Actually, you see in the background, that's the mathematics and computer science uh, faculty of the Technical University. And actually in 1962, they had a hard time finding out to which university they should give it to. So instead of giving it to a university, we were uh, funded as an institute for the Academy of Sciences. And that basically gives us a position to work with all the universities. 
So when we talk about the IT services for science, it primarily means we are supporting the universities in and around Munich, and we're providing those services that the scientists need from the desktop to the big machine. So it really means the, even the, the screen that I'm working on is one of our services. We have the standard desktops, which is more or less you get them, you plug them in, you log in with your uh, username, password, and you can immediately work with that. And we have about 6,500 of them around Munich. Now, if we take a closer look at the services, I mentioned it includes many things. Uh, it starts from email, for instance, for all these students and all the uh, uh, scientists. So we have 140,000 email accounts. We are running on the top left, the Munich Scientific Network, which is uh, connecting the 570 buildings of the two Munich universities and some other research institutions. We are connecting up to the Zugspitze, which is uh, Germany's highest mountain. And it has a research station up there where some people from the university sit. So in total, we have about uh, 4,600 kilometers just in the bigger area of Munich uh, connecting all these things. We are doing things also like storing all the digital uh, archive for the Bavarian State Library, which is one of the world's biggest digital institutions. So they have all these books and all these kinds of things. And we have on the bottom right, um, specialized hardware like the virtual reality and visualization center. I'll have an example of that one later. And then you add all these things like storage, cloud, cluster, uh, uh, HPC and these things. And then of course, what you have is, and that's where I'm very happy about, of course, is all these 260 ex experts. So the interesting fact is, although we are a German center, we have about 61 nations at the moment working with us uh, as staff members, so we are really international in that sense. And the important thing is, of course, that any of these hardware is useless if you don't have the people to do that. So I'm always saying these are the real kind of uh, gems that we have, the real uh, use, the, the best thing that we have is our experts. And you see two of them in the, in the, uh, uh, in the virtual reality center. Now, one additional thing we do is we are not only an IT service provider, uh, but we are also kind of funding about one third of our people from research and development projects. And that's always uh, kind of a bit to, to justify. Why are we doing research when there is the big universities? Actually, the reason is uh, we are complementing the research at the university in order to make the things a service that are being developed. So if you do new things at computer science, and you want to kind of distribute them to a large community so that they are using it, then we are doing the de development for that. We are also doing research with particular domain scientists because they cannot do it on their own. So that's computer science research that we are doing. And we are, of course, also coupling up with what is being done at two universities. And one of these efforts is, and that's kind of the, the, a good example, it's this technology exploration for future HPC architectures. So all these things like uh, AI, big data, quantum computing uh, is actually done. We're setting up test beds. We are running the test beds and they are being used by the universities which I'm mentioning there. So it's, it's a number of universities which are directly connected and then just working with us on making these services actually available to the larger public. Now, if we take it more systematically, then basically on the, on the bottom of this, this slide, you see all the, the different fields that we are working on. So one of the characteristics of our center is that we are very broad in terms of the applications that we are using. We'll, we'll get to the numbers for the HPC system alone, but we really believe it is uh, one of our valuable points that Every day you work with a different scientist, more or less. And you have to find ways to get their requirements on the one hand side, and then to also make sure that you, you, you provide specific help on the other side. Now, if you take, for instance, particle physics, they have good experience in using these systems. They have completely different needs from uh, the medical domain, where the people are kind of just getting first steps into what we do on the HPC uh, machines. Now, the, the area that we are providing all these services for is, of course, also with different uh, kind of uh, means and, and, and expertise. 
So it's not only the, the architecture portfolio that we have so different system, but it also means that we are working mostly on how is it possible to make that very useful and the usability and the workflow aspects, yeah? The integration of completely new domains, yeah? Yesterday, a, a, a legal person asked me, so it's nice that you're working with all these physics people, uh, but there is no way of working with legal people. I said, we will work with anyone, even with legal people in a sense, yeah? So the question is always, what are the demands? What do you need to do your science? And uh, that, that's where we're starting from. We provide expertise, of course, we do consulting. We are partners on projects. I'll, I'll show you some examples later. We, of course, have lots of training. So I think we are running 140 courses a year uh, on different aspects, starting from, of course, how you're using these software things, but also kind of programming going into MPI, uh, OpenMP, and also latest is quantum computing, of course. And that all contains within this, this, this uh, area that we have. And the important point is here, it must be a trust relation that we are building. So I'm, I'm working hard uh, to make sure that this is understood that we are working with all these partners. And the partners, if you take that, is shown on the next side. So I mentioned the Munich area, of course, but it's actually bigger. So we're doing things for all of the free state of Bavaria, which is one of the six in German states and Germany's uh, federation. We are also the German national supercomputing center, which is called the Gauss Center for Supercomputing and is actually the tier zero and one supercomputers in, in, in Germany. So we are doing that together with our friends in Stuttgart and in the research center in Jülich. And the three centers together have the task to provide the highest capability system for Germany. So any scientist can more or less use our services and we have to provide support for all of them. So if we buy one of these systems like SuperMUKNG, we get uh, at the same time a group of people making sure that the support is also going in there. And the same kind of support we're providing also to all of Europe. So a share of the, the cycles that we are giving away goes to large scale projects in Europe. So anybody from Europe can more or less apply to that. Now, Europe is, of course, in a, a time of change. So you see one of their slides here from the European Commission, uh, which is the still currently the president, Jean-Claude Juncker, and they were forming what they call EuroHPC. And the goal of that one is the ambition to have one of the top three HPC systems on the top 500. Yeah? So uh, you see some of the details here. This is just a side remark. And I've said that often enough to politics. I don't want one of the first three systems on the top 500. Yeah? What I want is the best systems for the users. And that might be something completely different. Now, our system is in the top 10 of the top 500. But the, the goal was not that we get top 10. The goal was actually that we get a system that is very useful for the sciences and for the applications that we have. And the system is actually shown on the next slide. That's again, this super MOOC next generation. You have some of the data in the block on the left side. So the system has 27 petaflops peak performance and uh, we measured 19.5 petaflops LINPEC. Well, uh, truth is we could go higher in these performance measurements. But in fact, we stopped at that point because uh, one of the runs of just running this LINPEC cost 50,000 uh, euros, uh, even more if you just add some of the surrounding stuff that you need and the time that is lost for scientific applications. Mm -hmm. And I was not willing to pay more for just getting a, a benchmark number. So what we want to do is the benchmark for us, as I call it, is the happy user index. How many users are really happy with using the system, making sure it works? I mentioned that it doesn't have any GPUs in there. And just a side effect, why doesn't it have any GPUs in there? Well, we start from uh, a group of applications which comprise our benchmarks and all the vendors have to bid for that one. And this system is actually one that has the best performance across all the applications. So we don't have any GPUs in there because with the width of application we are having, uh, a pure Xeon based system gives us the best performance. 
Now you can also take a look at the room. So that's the top floor of the twin cube as I've shown you. And it actually contains not only SuperMOOC Next Generation, which is the one with the green cables, but also in the background, you see two, two more SuperMOOCs that's SuperMOOC phase one on the, on the top left and SuperMOOC phase two on the top right. So the, the other two systems each have three point something uh, petaflops. So we have this cycle going around also upgrading and we've just thrown out the back part of the room. So phase one, because that's where we are getting the new system. And as I said, the important thing is actually this slide. It's uh, all the different applications that are running on our system. Now, of course, there's some who are using it more like astrophysics can use any system uh, as long as you give it to them. Yeah? So if you take a look at the diversity of the applications, you also see that uh, we have, of course, physics in there and physics accounts to about one third of what uh, is running on the system. Computational fluid dynamics is about another third. So the rest of the applications make up about one third of what we are providing to them. And the idea is actually, and that's the statistics, that we satisfy them and uh, we help them to use the system for their particular needs. So these are the numbers that I was mentioning. So just on the SuperMOOC systems, so on the, on the three systems, we've been spending 9.5 billion compute hours for their research, uh, processing 6.3 million jobs of 820 research projects. And I think the core number is this 820 research projects. So that is again a demonstration of the wits that we are uh, providing to, to our scientists. And it's not that many researchers if you account for. So it's, it's 2,200 researchers. And again, what you have to do is to justify uh, the actual uh, investment with what the scientists are doing. Now, David, I wanted to provide you with the slides if anybody's interested. You see on this one also there's a QR code, and that's actually a reference to one of our ebooks, which contains all of these applications. So everybody running an application here has to provide a report. So it's two page each, and you have a nice overview of what's actually going on in our results book. Now let's go to one of these areas, and that's I wanted to talk about that's environmental computing. Now we had to agree with the other two centers uh, on different focus areas. And for us, it was important to make sure that environment is an aspect that we are taking care of. That has to do with uh, the, 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 the land size of the free state of Bavaria, but also with the focus of the local scientists. So we have many scientists working in that domain and it actually comprises quite a number of different applications from disaster management to allergy prevention. What you see on this slide is different projects going on at this particular moment, also making sure that we are really capturing these different needs with different aspects of what they want to do. Now let's take one of the example, which is the earthquakes, which is actually a code that has been developed here and that's pretty much shows why the big system is, is, is useful. Well, actually what you see here is uh, a production run of these SISOL code, uh, seismic wave phenomena that we are simulating here. And that's done by two people from uh, the LMU, that's the University of Munich and the Technical University together. And as you see, we are using on one of the earlier super MOOCs, we are able with this code to go up to 44.5% of the peak performance. And we consider that uh, quite a record for a production run. So they are running this code on the entire system about once a month with different kinds of simulations. So they are scheduling for one month. And then after the maintenance with the system is empty, we put them in and they're running it. And what you see there is actually the production runs. So of course the code is, is, is good in terms of HPC. So it, it, it uh, got the, Michael, uh, the George Michael award it got the Borden, went to the Gordon Bell finalists. We got a praise award and these kinds of things. So it is really a project where we see how it works together. And the truth is that one of the, the persons here on the slide doing that, the TUM professor, Michael Bader, has his offices at our center. So he's integrated, he's working with us and the optimization he's doing is actually with the people from the center to make sure that their code runs optimally. 
And the other reason why they are very uh, much in need of what we're doing. So Michael is able to run on all the big systems around the world. He always gets allocations there, but the difference is the only system where he gets the entire system for his research is ours. So even if he goes to China or to US, he does never get the full system. So that's one of the values they want to get from us and it helps us in making sure that we are kind of enabling them to do their research. Now let's take, go away a little bit from this large scale application to something on the complete opposite side. Uh, that's the pollen information network. So we are predicting uh, and monitoring the pollen flight in Bavaria using a network of pollen monitors. That sounds a bit strange. You would assume that this is already in place for quite some years. Well, truth is, uh, I've understood that they were collecting statistical data, and when you get all these predictions, they are based on the experience from the past years. But there's no systematic way to kind of monitor what's going on at this point in time. So these people came to us and said, we don't need that much uh, in terms of computing performance. We don't need that much in terms of storage. Because all we have, and you see that in the bottom left is with the green top and, 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 and uh, the feet standing on one of the rooftops, that's one of these sensors. It's actually not one sensor, it's a group of sensors and air comes in and then the air is kind of analyzed. The problem is really they need to kind of distribute these little measurement stations across the state. They need to collect the data, so they need network connectivity they need, of course, some permanent storage. And the, the idea is really that you conduct it somewhere centrally, even so it's only small data in a sense, make sure that you can distribute it again to the larger community, and then eventually also do some processing, but we don't need the HPC for that. So they came in with completely different, Sharon Butters, that's the name that you see there, he came in with completely different kind of requirements. And the important part there was, that in the beginning he was afraid to talk to us because he said, well, you have all these big systems. Why would you be interested in such a small project? So the truth is we have, spending, have been spending a lot of things of, on all this to make sure that, that everybody is welcome and people just start talking to us. And we still have to improve on that one, of course, because there's never an end to that story. On the other hand, once we did this sensor network, more or less, we also got in contact with what you see here. That is the research station on the Zugspitze. So that's the Germany's highest mountain. And just be below the peak, there is this former hotel where the kind of the state bought it and they have put it full with sensors. There is 1000 sensors around there measuring everything. Uh, for instance, they were the first ones to detect the, uh, the nuclear explosion from Chernobyl at that part of, uh, when that happened. And they have many other things on the roof. So that the roof is, is, it's hard to walk on the roof with all the sensors there more or less. Yeah? But then on the other hand, for us, the other project was a good starting point because we were able to connect all these sensors, again, very simply to our research network. And they come back and then have more and more requirements on how that's going in. And many projects are just starting with what they call the Virtual Alps Observatory. and uh, our role in the background is to make sure that the infrastructure works. Now, the next example I have here combines both of these things. Yeah? So it combines, on the one hand, people like Ralph Ludwig, who is the PI on that project. He's a, working uh, on hydrology and he's interested in extreme events that are going on. Actually, Ralph and myself, we didn't know each other four years ago. We just met accidentally by one of the university parties. So that's a reason why you should go to these parties. And we were discussing and, and he said, uh, what are you doing? I said, what I'm doing. He told me what he's doing. And I said, well, you must be using our systems, aren't you? And he said, wow, I didn't know I could use your systems. And I said, of course, that's what they are there for. So we introduced him uh, less than four years ago and then took him and really made him work on these systems. We took him with his code, we spent some time getting his code up and scalable and all these things. And then uh, a while ago, he got his first allocation on the system with 82 million core hours. 
Now, what he's studying is one of the pictures. You see that on the right? That's one of, from the newspapers where the trucks are standing in water. Well, actually, that's one of the big uh, freeway crossings, Autobahn uh, in Germany, that was flooded by one of the recent floodings we had. And that flooding is also kind of relevant because it, it took a wide area of people around. So that crossing was more or less closed for a year just to do all the renovation. Now, Ralf was interested in finding out with codes that we started from codes that they got from Quebec, from Canada, adopted them to what we do in, in, in Bavaria, and then find out how climate change would influence uh, the, the number of extreme events we have and the size of the extreme events. So he, he, he got for a research project to find the assessment of the effects of climate change. And that was very welcome. It was welcome also in a sense because it's funded not by the science department of the government, it's funded by the environmental department. And they haven't even known that there is such a big system around. So again, we, we were able to get them from zero up to this first allocation. Now his first allocation was 82 million core hours. And of course he got it sometimes in October, started simulating. And just before Christmas, he came around and said, well, I would need uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 million extra just to finish my research. And that was really within three years, we got him that far. And now he has all these, these project results. And what you can see here, and I hope the video, oh yeah, it shows some, I think as you see some movement. So what you see here is two of my re, uh, staff members walking inside the cave, uh, showing the visualization of Bavaria. And what you see there is the, pre, uh, well, kind of the predicted rainfall over some parts of Bavaria. So we are predicting what happens with climate change in 2040 or in the time frame between 2040 and 2070. And the simulation shows that it's most probably that the, the, the number of extreme events increases and also the impact increases. So we are comparing with uh, sensor data that we have from previous floodings, uh, continue to do the increase that we see in climate change over the time, and then we get this uh, nice visual representation in the cave where you can walk in and discuss with people what that means. Of course, people need to understand that these are probabilities, yeah? But the effect of the climate change in Bavaria means that we will have more periods, longer periods of dry uh, time uh, compared to more intensive rainfall in very short time. Now, the visualization itself is just the result of the data that Ralph was producing. So he produced some 7,500 years of predictions, uh, which is about 450 megabytes of data. And what you can do with the visualization, easily browse through and see the different options and see that actually most of them are really devastating if, if, if you see the consequences of climate change. Anyway, this application also is good in a sense because we can show it to politicians. And we've already had the prime minister in there and we had some other people in there. And it also kind of connects with them with the, with the science. Now, what I've shown you with these examples is more or less the basis for what we call a, a way of cooperating with our people. Best, best practices and collaborations, so to say. We call it our partnership model. And we actually have a number of steps that we do. The first one is, to make sure that we get these people on, the, on board in the first place. So what we are doing is, we call them partnership workshops. So it's called PICS. So it's the Partnership Initiative for Computational Science. And it's actually to overcome this barrier that some people just don't know what you're doing. So we invite them to our place. They get a short, very brief kind of introduction what the center's mission is. Then they get some tour to the visualization center. So they see other applications and that has already generated new ideas. They also see the big machine. And then we do kind of uh, discussions on their open questions. So they bring uh, requirements that tell us what they need, all these kinds of things. Yeah. So that's the first step. And we actually do this. And, and I think that's what we talked about in San Diego. We do this by just browsing the catalog of professors. 
So the universities get about 70 new professors every year. So just following what the new ones are and making sure that they understand what is here is already quite some effort. So on average, our target is we are doing one of these partnership workshops per month. And uh, it's really individual with different people contributing, interested in what they are doing. And these are really kind of uh, also scientifically interesting workshops. Now, once we have them, we try to kind of find those which have interesting projects and we try to kind of partner up with them to establish them as flagship roles. So they have kind of a role where we can show examples to other people. And the examples that I've shown you are some typical roles here. So this helps us also to make sure that we have things to show around. And actually, uh, you need also these things when somebody from the ministry is coming. So it's always good to have these kind of demonstrations there. Now, what they get in turn is they get a dedicated point in contact. Uh, now, what we really try always, and, and, and we are hiring people from all the different domains, so that the astrophysics people first talks to our astrophysics person in the center. And the astrophysics person in the center is then uh, the multiplying effect for all the other points that we have there. So what we have is this individual support and guidance. We also do targeted training and education. And that means things like joint lectures. So we had a lecture on hydro uh, hydrologic events and uh, computer science, which was actually open to 50% students from the computer science domain and 50% students from hydrology. And they mixed up also. So it was a, we allowed only 20, 20 students, 10 from those sides, 10 from the other side. And we give every week, it was either a computer science lecture or a hydrology lecture. And in the end, we had students who were able to work basically with all the machines in the best possible way. We also try things like uh, optimized IT infrastructures. So it's often hard for, for these new domains, for these uh, domain scientists to try different kind of infrastructures. They're buying a clusters and they have to stick with that uh, as long as the cluster is running. We can kind of much more spazzy the, the, the requirements and then go to different, try out new uh, environments, new systems, and then find out what we need to invest in the future. We give them actually the access to not only the, the, the hardware, but also we help them with new software. So I was just negotiating this week, we'll, we'll, we'll get early access to some of Intel's technology. And then again, it helps us to understand what's going on, what they need, and then how to build these systems in the first place. And that, of course, goes for hard and software. Then we collect these specifications in a very structured way, because when we think of the next HPC machine, uh, we need to make sure that it also fulfills the requirements. So the difficulty here is that users need to understand, what do I want to do in five years? That's sometimes a very hard question for the users. So they always think of how big is the system? What can I do with it today? But what we want them to do is, what would you want to do in five years? Where is your goals? What do you expect there? And then collect these specifications, which also helps us in writing our proposals, but also the, uh, the procurement document, of course. Then the, the next point is with our role, uh, and that's very similar, of course, to what you're doing. Uh, you are a very good bridge between the different experts. So if I need a person from algorithm design or a person from some mathematical department, then we usually have the contacts. So if somebody from geography comes and they need some experts, we can very well uh, establish the contacts, make the bridges, then in the, in the end, it's a three-way relationship and you get their applications forward. Actually, talking with the experts, we also found out one thing that is very useful. We are kind of sending our IT experts to the other institutions. So we have actually experts who are spending a day a week with the different domain departments. So they are really sitting there working with laptops or whatever, doing their stuff. And they also have these kind of uh, interaction with the users. They understand very early on where they want to go and they can over coffee just discuss the next uh, fancy idea on what to do. 
and all that what you see here is kind of what we are providing to them without kind of additional uh, input from them. But once you have that, it comes to point five and you do this joint research project. You actually obtain funding. So like the example I had with Ralph Ludwig with the, with the environmental department from the government, they have never given money to us for doing research. But when they saw what is possible, we really have some good projects. And I think at the moment, we already have five projects just being funded by the environmental domain. Of course, digitalization is in every domain, so it gets forward on how to do that. Now, Climax is also a good example that it doesn't stop there. You don't do this, this one-off project, but starting kind of working with Ralph's group, uh, we also tried some new things, and that also led, of course, to nice joint publications. Uh, but again, the point here is, and that's why I, I put it here in, in, in blue, Ralph always took us as an equal partner on equal footing. So it's not that we are service provider. We were always going in there with the assumption and with the requirement that if you really want to work well with us, you need to accept that computer science or computational science is really providing uh, some special uh, um, pro, uh, services for you. So it's not the service provisioning alone, but it's the partnership to develop their projects. Now getting back to Ralph, and that's what I wanted to come to actually, is what we did then afterwards. Because Ralph was producing these 400 terabyte of data uh, with his climate ensembles, and then we had the data. And then uh, interesting thing is, one of his students came and she asked, well, I have this idea uh, that we could maybe train a neural network and then learn something more about it. She was particularly interested in what we see there, these 5B weather conditions. So the question was whether you could kind of use the data that you have from the climate ensembles and see if it really fits to what we observed with these weather conditions. Now these 5B weather conditions uh, uh, are points where we had extreme weather situations. And she could, with her neural network, and then with the support from our team. So she was more or less coming up with this idea over coffee. One of my people said, well, we have the, uh, it's actually NVIDIA DGX systems. Why don't we just try to model that and see where it leads us? They were talking to that one. And in the end, we had really a nice project showing that we had in our climate ensembles, we could exactly pinpoint the days of uh, former extreme weather situations. So this research was never planned in a sense, yeah? It came up because these young people were talking together. We had them in this partnership model and the partnership model delivered something new, some new research that we were able to do. And I think that's, that's showing some of the examples. Now there's more of these examples. This is Professor Chao Chang Tzu. She works with the uh, German Aerospace uh, Institution and also with the Technical University. What you see here is TUM's, uh, another TUM, Berlin's uh, Tiergarten. So that's the, the main green area inside the center of, of, of Berlin, more or less. And she is working with the aerospace uh, agency to understand the data from the Earth's observation. Now, she had a very simple problem. She said, I have this data, and if I don't find a place to store it, then it's lost forever. What we're talking here is four petabytes of data. So uh, I think it's not that easy for everybody to store four petabytes of data, at least at this point in time. But what we did is we made sure that she was able to store the data with us. So we were using some of the available storage. We were trying to help her with transferring it. So it, in the end, we worked with, with, with tape drives, of course. But once she had the data with us, she's able to do things which are again uh, uh, kind of uh, showing some nice research. So what you see here with the point cloud is actually the main railway station in Berlin. And actually what she found out with her Earth observation data is that the, the building is expanding and shrinking over time. So it is more or less uh, dependent on the environmental uh, situation and it shows the stress factors on the building. 
and now they are renovating it. Well, of course, uh, that's the drawback you have with this additional no knowledge. Mm -hmm. Now, an ex another example, I'm not sure why it's going the wrong direction. So another example is this one here. And I'll make this very short. So this is a simulation. I'll start the simulation and uh, don't be confused. It actually goes reverse in time. So what we are simulating is the Earth's mantle and we want to understand the tectonic plate movement. So when you see it, you see actually how the tectonic plates are moving. What we are seeing here is 200 million years of simulation. And you see there's some uh, amounts, it's 12 terabyte of data. Well, actually we're now experimenting with, with 30 uh, terabytes. And, and that's just the set that you're seeing. And, and what we're doing here is again, they were not able to do this on their own. They were able to do the simulations and all these kinds of things, but they couldn't visualize it. You cannot just take 12 terabyte or 17 terabyte or 30 terabyte and visualize it. So we really had to spend research on making sure what you see there is actually interactive. And what you can actually do, and that's what you see here on another stage is, you can walk through that and you see the simulation while it's progressing. So you can walk through all these amounts of data and then understand the tectonic plate movement. It's actually something that we also use for public relations. So that's in the Ars Electronica Center. That's a festival each year in my hometown. Uh, it's a very international festival. And we are explaining science to people by showing what we were able to do with the systems. Now this simulation, if you go to another continent, if you go to the New York City, you have the American Museum of Natural History there. And you see the three people, the, the, the two people from there and myself in the center, you see uh, this is the Ruth and uh, David and Ruth L. Gottesman Hall of Planet Earth. And you see the object in the background, which is also highlighted on the left side of the, of the uh, uh, picture of the slide here. That is actually a 3 preprint of our data. They came to our center, took the data, made a 3D print, and you see it, it's about one meter in diameter. You see that in the core of the, of the, of the exhibition there. And that's also one thing where we say we, can, we are able to kind of bring science to the people. And then of course, it's interesting to see that the simulation is producing something solid. So I hope I was able to show you some examples. I'm not in the end here, but I kind of want to conclude a little bit in between. So what we told you is this environmental computing as a focus area. And the important part is this collaboration between the computer scientists on the one hand side and the domain scientists on the other hand side, which I believe is where we have many things in common. And I told you that we need this as a partnership. So we see ourselves in a kind of network between the different institutions. Well, the network actually also represents the, 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 the land size of Bavaria here. But the important point is that we have these competitive IT services, and we're not just providing it as a service to the user, but the service is actually to make sure that we are putting all these things together. And I wanted to just spend a couple of more words on the science we are doing. Yeah? So an example for that one is, we do environmental science with our users. We also want to make sure that our systems are environmental friendly as much as possible. Now there's of course a little bit of a, an understanding when you spend 1000 euros per hour on electricity, you are generating some impact. But what we are doing is we are spending lots of amount of our own research on energy efficiency. So what you see there is that all our systems are specifically kind of uh, adjusted to make sure that when we do simulations, we do them as energy efficient as possible. And what you see there is our hot water cooling, for instance. Sounds a bit strange, but it's something that was really invented in collaboration with a number of companies here at the center. We're doing a couple of more things. We're using the waste heat for heating the building, for also adsorption uh, cooling. So we're doing very much research there. Now, by just doing this energy efficient computing, we are saving about 2 million euros per year in terms of the electricity bill. And since in the end of the year, we have to spend all the money, that means we have 2 million more to spend on science and research. So by doing 
the energy efficient research by making sure that we are kind of trying to, to, to make the energy consumption as minimal as possible, we are actually able to generate more budget for other research projects for other domains. And that comes with a number of things like developing the system. So what you see here is a product from Lenovo, which kind of was including the hot water cooling and they wouldn't have done it if we wouldn't have kind of pressured them in that way. So we asked them to build a system of that size in hot water cooling, which also has some other requirements. Just to give you an idea, each of these cabinets includes 3,000 uh, 3, liters of water per hour. So putting that all together also means we have this equipment, we have to see how we transport the water in the building. This is the double floor, which basically kind of like connects from the bottom with the water to all the systems. So over the runtime of the system, we're saving uh, really some tremendous amount of, of budget and we are actually able to buy bigger systems just by using all these things. So our research not only contains the things that you see here, but is more or less making sure that all these aspects play together, like the direct hot water cooling, the heat reusage, uh, the energy we are scheduling, all the instrumentation that we are doing, and then in the end, the DCDB, which is one of our highlights for what we do at SC this year. Now, the important point is also, and that's why I always like talking to David and, 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 and learning what you are doing here, is no, this, this, this doesn't work in isolation. Yeah? So we are seeking really international collaborations. As I mentioned, uh, we have 260 staff members from 61 nations. Uh, so the biggest nation is the Italians, strange enough, so they seem to like it in our area. Uh, but in, in principle, the idea really comes because the good ideas are everywhere and we want to integrate people. We are energy efficient, not only because we, we, we kind of are asked by our ministry to do something there, but also because our experts love to work in that domain. So there's many different ideas that we could do there. And I was looking, David, you were saying this is a newer version. Now, one of the new slides is this one. And that's kind of a sneak preview. Because again, what we did here is we're visualizing the largest uh, turbulence simulation uh, on the planet. And when you take a look that the first person is actually working on Australia, uh, that also shows how that connects together. So what we see there is some astrophysics simulation of how a star is born. But as I said, it's, it's people from your side of the, of the planet working with people on our side on these joint research projects. And what you see here is a sneak preview of what we are, will be showcasing at SC in Denver when we see each other. So I'm, I'm, I'm always kind of using this idea to see how we get to. And of course, you have to say that Munich is a lovely place. You see some of the typical things out there. Uh, sun is coming up slowly. So it, it is really getting, I think, a nice day again. Now, the important thing is, of course, uh, that this talk is also meant to, to ensure that what I'm doing with David is, is kind of a, a good basis. If you have any interest, let us know. And with that, I'm at the end and I want to show you one more thing because I know this is Halloween. I don't know if you're celebrating Halloween uh, in your country there, but this is what my people did. And we have now this pumpkin outside in front. Of course, the computer science people had to make it with LEDs and make sure that you see different colors when you drive by. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. <laughs>